So today we are continuing our yogic path. And you don't have to have watched the first one to watch this, to listen to this one. But we're looking at the yamas and the niyamas. And in yoga, they have the eight limbs of yoga, which Patanjali put together many, many, many <laughs> centuries or thousands of years ago to try to understand the different aspects of a yogic path. And by yogic path, we don't mean pra, uh, we don't need we don't mean asana. We don't mean the path of someone just doing postures. We mean the yogic path of a soul, of what it means to really feel alive, to really feel whole, to really live from a soul's place and feel like we have a real mission in life in a positive way, that we wake up in the morning and, and it makes sense. This, our circumstances make sense and what we have at our fingertips makes sense and our passions have a place to manifest this is a yogic life, that we're whole. You know, David Bohm used to call it being an individual. Uh, he, well, he used to also talk about the fact that most people were individuals. He really loved to play with language because he believed that language really formed our thoughts. And he said, so you have to decide, do you want to be a individual, one who is divided, or an individual? one who is undivided and whole. So the yogic path is the choice to be an individual. I don't want to be split. I don't want to have my mind in a million places. I don't want to be even things like taking on the emotions of other people or taking on the thought patterns of other people. It's the idea that, no, this soul is unique and I want to walk my path. The path that I was made for, the path that for whatever reason, this incarnation, this collection of gifts, challenges, courage, fears, everything, whatever this interesting compilation is, I want to experience that in its fullness. And I can't do it if my soul or my personality, my soul doesn't get divided, but if my personality is split into five different parts and this part's trying to make you happy and this part's trying to achieve this thing that society says and this thing's succumbing to all the fears of my karmic past and this thing is having issues with all the Akashic patterns that I think I'm supposed to be playing out and my poor soul is sitting in the middle going, oh my, you know, we're like being, you know, what do you call it, drawn and quartered, you know, in life. And we're just walking around going, oh, is this really what life's about? <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm just like so pulled in a million directions. So then, of course, many, many, many years ago, all these schools of yoga came about. And all it means is it's a collection of techniques and philosophies to bring us back together. Asana, which we normally attribute to yoga, is one limb of the eight limbs of yoga. And it isn't even what we think. It's not achieving a handstand. It's lit and we'll talk about these things later, but you know, it's 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 our posture, it's our seat, it's how we sit on the earth. And so there's many, many, many different ways to become whole. And one of the limbs of yoga that he came about with or with that he created or described was something that he called the yamas and yama in Sanskrit means restraint and there's a number of reasons why we talk about restraints and these aren't like so in, in past teachings We've talked about the idea that there are two worlds existing at the same time. There's a world of light that is clarity and truth and wisdom. It's those things inside of us that we know on a good day. You know, we know what's possible 
in relationships. We know what's possible in our relationship with nature. We know what's possible in terms of human happiness. And it's real. It's not a utopia, a utopic fantasy. It's a real thing. And then there's this other world, the shadow world, this very strange world we've all been living in for many, many generations. And it's very dark and it's full of cruelty. And it's based in strange things like money (laughs) and the ownership of parts of earth as if you can own earth and there's all these very strange things and this shadow world I believe is passing away and so very often when we first hear about things like restraints we we see it from that shadow world perspective that we were all born into that says what do you mean I can't do what I want like no I I mean you're not going to restrain me it's almost like In the shadow world, we are so oppressed. Our soul is so not allowed to live. We are pulled in so many directions. The last thing we want is to hear about some yogic path that says, and guess what else you can't do? (laughs) And, you know, if you're anything like me, I have a bit of a rebellious streak inside of me if you try to tell me not to do something. Like, I will kick and scream and I'll probably end up even doing things I don't want to do just for the sake of getting to do my own thing. Now you can't be you're not the boss of me. You don't get to tell me. <laughs> like I'm going to do it. So the reason that this yogic path in the light that we're talking about here is let's imagine these yamas, these restraints having been written or given to us assuming we don't live in the shadow world let's imagine that we live in the world of light we live in that clear space inside of us because that's what we want to expand the more we focus on the other and i'm not saying bypassing and spiritual bypassing and all that i'm just saying when we it's almost like when someone wants attention and they, they just, they want to distract you from what you're doing, right? And so you're just perpetually being pulled to them no matter what. And eventually you're just like, stop. And like, are you ignoring them? It's like, no, I'm just not going to be distracted by you any longer. Enough. Take it somewhere else. I've got some stuff I want to do today. You know, that's all it is to simply say, you know what? I'm not going to be concerned with these weird ideas that we were all raised in, the weird pool we've all been swimming in for generations. I'm going to focus on this light world that also exists. It's equally real, perhaps much more real, in my opinion, in my experience. So all of a sudden, why does yoga create these yamas? Why does it create restraints for us well there's two big reasons and today for example we're looking at the yama in sanskrit it's asteya i'm actually going to type it here asteya and it means non-stealing essentially and and it means more than that but it it essentially means non-stealing So there's two big reasons that we want to embrace this restraint. And they're not because we're bad people or we have some character flaw that we always, you know, want more than what we want and we don't feel like we're good enough and all these things which do come out of the shadow world, which do cause us to steal or to want more than we need, right? But when we really focus on this in the light, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to embrace Asteya. Well, the first one is the restraints act like bumpers if you want to go bowling, right? That's how I see the restraints. Because when I first started bowling, and I don't bowl very often, and I'm not really an athlete. <laughs> when I say I'm not really an athlete, what I mean is I'm not an athlete. <laughs> 
And so even something like bowling, which isn't terribly athletic, but it still requires some hand-eye coordination. I always wanted to have the bumpers up in the, in the, in the gutters because it was the only chance I had of getting the ball to the end of the, uh, in, into the end of the lane. Well, that's what the yamas are like. They're like, trust me, stay out of the gutters. Just stay out of them. Like, I'm not saying you can't go into the gutter if you don't want to, but there is so much in the shadow world that is simply a distraction. And those distractions could own you for your entire life. They could distract you for lifetimes. And not only do they create distractions, they create more problems that then distract you, that then you have to address. And then if you, if we continually are distracted by these things, we don't get to live our path. We don't get to live this soul's path because we're perpetually being pulled off our own journey. Like it truly is a restraint for our benefit. It's not, it's not against us. It's not against our personal freedom as a human. It's not against us as I want what I want. How come I can't have chocolate? You know, it's not like that. It's like, no, really. Let's get rid of all the things that aren't you. Let's purify the cauldron. You know, that's the key. And we're going to talk a lot more about that. But the second reason that we want to embrace something like Asteya, not only does it keep us on our path, but it also allows us to live in harmony with our surroundings. And this is a really beautiful one, specifically about Asteya. Because Asteya isn't just not stealing. It's also not taking more than you need or not keeping more than you need. So if you imagine nature, nature takes exactly what it needs from its environment only. A tree only draws the water it, does, it needs. It takes the nutrients out of the soil, the soil that's needed. And what happens is because everything in that ecosystem is taking exactly what it needs, also giving back to the ecosystem, there is symbiosis and there's harmony in the ecosystem. But what if there was a plant, and this is where it's difficult, like say when an invasive plant is introduced to uh, um, an ecology, because that plant is not in balance and it starts to take more than, well, it actually just throws the whole thing off. But if something went in and started taking more than it needed, what would happen to the balance in the ecosystem? Like it throws the whole thing off. And, you know, there's a, there's a great movie that was done a while ago called I Am. But it's a really interesting movie about hoarding. And he's not talking about the hoarders that they put on TV. He's talking about the hoarding of wealth. And he was saying, he told this story about historically when humans lived in nature, in, um, in beautiful harmony and symbiosis with their surroundings, they too only took what they needed and gave back, you know, what they could. And they said, you know, if... They, if there was a tribe and they went on a hunt and they came back with the hunt or gathering the berries or whatever they did and one person took more than what they needed, that would be considered a mental illness. Like the people would look at that person and say, I wonder why they would take more than they need. And then, of course, that person then has to... has to... Um, protect it and make sure no one else takes it because it's his right you can feel how odd that is it's like why is that isn't that isn't that strange you know but of course it only seems strange in the world of light in the world of harmony in the world of balance in the world of knowing that we live in a place of abundance 
You know, it's spring in Canada right now. It is like the world is literally like with life, with food, with foliage, with birds, with it's just it is spring. Every year spring comes and the abundance of the world just goes right? But we don't live very connected to that. We live in a very strange, superficial place that's sort of, again, dictated by the shadow world that says, <clears throat> no, 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 there's no abundance. We are vi- vi- huge scarcity issues. <laughs> right? And of course, this becomes this foundation for this weird It's like an illness that's been sort of placed inside of our minds that says, there's not enough. There's not enough. And not only is there not enough out there, you're not really enough either. And this is where everything starts to go crazy. And this didn't begin with us. This didn't begin in May 2022 that we suddenly, you know, developed this strange I'm not enough. There isn't enough in the world. This has been going on for millennia. You know, and it, but what's interesting today is it's becoming very obvious that it's not true. So then we have to seriously look at this word enough. And I know this sounds so simplistic, but if I was to say to you, Do you have enough food? What does that mean? Enough. Do you define it in your own mind? Like, and I, you know, for just for each of us to think about that. If I was to say, do you have enough food? Does that mean you have enough food for today to eat? Do I have enough food for what? What does that mean? Because what's really weird is we've, redefine the word enough to mean excess. Oh, I have enough for today and for the next month and for a rainy day and all that. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about um, storing food for later and all that. I mean, this was a natural part of farming also, right? When you grew your own food, you harvested it, you canned it, you kept it. This is what got you through the winter. I'm not talking about healthy storage of food. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this definition of the word enough. Do I have enough money? Do I have enough friends? Do I have enough what? And this enough is so weird because somewhere in there we've redefined it that there's no such thing as enough. There's not enough time. There's not, if I have money, I can always use more. If I have enough food, I can always use more. If I have enough clothing, I can always use more. It's like, well, that's not enough. Enough means I have what I need. And even there, you say, yeah, you have what you need, but it's not what you want. You want, like there's more to life. You know, you don't have to, like we even kind of demonize the idea of, Well, you don't have to just live bare bones, you know. We don't have to all be kind of zen with nothing in our homes besides what we absolutely... We we have this whole dialogue about the evil of just enjoying what we have. And that the, the joy in life comes from having more. But what if you could upgrade? What if you could change that? What if you could have more, you know? And it's a very interesting thing. Thomas Merton, I love Thomas Merton. He was a Trappist monk many years ago. And he used to talk about this. He used to talk about how, you know, the consumer society, this very strange, which is a huge part of the shadow world, right? There's a big difference between someone who makes chairs because people need chairs and another person who makes new chairs every year because they want you to buy a different chair because they want to make money even though you have a chair so then they have to do all kinds of advertising to figure out how to make you want the new chair (laughs) and throw out your old chair which is a whole different thing than simply creating 
what we need. And so Thomas Merton used to talk about how <clears throat> this advertising and marketing and this weird money-driven consumer society created artificial needs in us. And these artificial needs would keep us so distracted and so desiring of whatever we didn't have that we never got to have a contemplative life, which is what he was all about. Like we never got to just relax and enjoy the fact that we have enough. You know, that there, what if everything you have right now is truly enough? And this is a very interesting thing also. Because we've been so accustomed to running at such a fast pitch, right? That we're just running, 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 right? Fast pitch, fast pace. And that we run so fast, we think, if just for a moment, if we were to say, what if I have enough right now? It's almost like we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. So like, I, I don't... I don't need any more. I don't need more than I have right now. Like there's almost such a quiet inside. It feels so unnatural that we think, well, I must be missing something because I feel so quiet inside and I don't feel like I need anything else. Like, am I dead? Like this doesn't even feel natural. So it's a very interesting thing to embrace this idea of enough because even, even in school, in society, we're even taught that even ourselves, well, I may be happy with who I am, but you can always learn more and you can always be a little fitter. Uh, you know, you can become more fit. You can always run a little faster. You can always do this. Like I remember years ago, I was training with a guy um, doing, we were doing barefoot running and, and I was training for a marathon. And, and he was such an interesting man because when we would train together, he, he never, it was never about getting a faster time at the next race. His entire philosophy about running was he wanted to train today so that he was still running when he was 100 years old. That was his goal. It didn't matter how fast he ran. It didn't matter what his time was. It didn't matter. He loved running. He loved what it did. He loved how it made him feel. He loved the joy of it. He loved the challenge of it, you know? And he wanted to be doing it 60 years, we were, both, we were both in our 40s at the time. And he wanted to be doing it 60 years from now. And that's a very different thing. You know, that we don't, we don't have this perpetual, I can be better, I can be better, I can be better. Because the weird thing is when we perpetually need to be better, we never get to enjoy this. We never get to enjoy where I am right now. And in, in the spirit of Asteya, we're literally stealing the joy from this experience because I'm not good enough, because I can always be better. And again, I'm not talking about stopping the joys of human expansion. I fully, I love I love embracing the idea of human expansion that at all times we get to continually grow and grow and grow and grow. But I'm not growing because I'm not good enough. I'm growing because I'm intrigued about something. I'm growing because I want to experience something interesting. I, I, I have a something inside of me that wants to grow another branch like a tree. The tree was perfect when it grew the set, the new branch. Now it just has more branches, right? So this isn't about not expanding. It's about not expanding in ways that aren't ours. So if we come back to the idea of staying on our path, that the, the Yamas and Asteya says, this, is, this will help us stay on our path. 
So I always vision this like a, a, like a path. So here I am walking along my path and every one of us has a very unique and interesting path to take. Asteya is like I'm on my path and I look over there and I see that person over there and I think, wow, look what they've got. Oh, wow, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like some of that. <laughs> right? I don't need it. I have enough for my path. I have what I need. <clears throat> but that looks really, that looks really good. <laughs> I, I'd like some of that. Sorry, I so should have got a glass of water. <clears throat> so I'd like some of that. Well, what's going to happen if my eyes become focused on that thing over there that I want? Well, I'm going to start to do this. And I'm going to go over there and I'm going to try to get that thing. I'm going to try to get whatever it is that they want, they have. But I don't need it. It's not on my path. You know, so we go along our path. And this is what it's like. It's like we go along and the advertisers come in and they say, you want this, right? Look how happy these people are. And you're like, wow, I guess... I don't think so. And then the, the second person, the third person, the fourth person, and the, like the hundredth time you hear it, you go, wow, I, I guess I really do want a new patio set. <laughs> and then you think, well, I'm not stealing. I bought it, right? That's okay. I just, I bought it. The problem is we didn't need it. And now who are we stealing from? Nature? the resources that it had to take to make that wooden chair, plastic chair, rubber thing, whatever, we are stealing. You know, it has to come from somewhere. And it isn't something we need. Because it's the yoga is not about living without. And that's not it. We have to just really be clear. What are our true needs? And then the next thing is, am I stealing from myself? Because I don't need the thing, but now I have to make the money to buy the thing. So I have to work more and then I have to go and get the thing. I have to maintain the thing. I have to clean the thing. I have to protect the thing. I have to make sure nobody steals it. And one day down the road, when I no longer want it, I then have to throw it out and somehow nature has to sort itself out. It's a complete distraction if it's not needed, right? So it's a very interesting thing to actually just ask ourselves clearly, what is it that I need? And if you were to imagine, what if, what if you were climbing a mountain, a, you know, real mountain climbing? Would you take more than you need? Or would we take exactly what we need, right? We would take enough for all possibilities, maybe, you know, we might take an extra something in case we hit a, uh, a winter storm. We might take a little bit of extra this because of that, but it's all truly a need. You know, it's being intelligent and wise for the journey, but we won't take anything we don't need. This is the spirit of Asteya. Can you imagine the simplicity of really being clear about what it is we need on our path individually and only carrying that. Like how little we would require. You know, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, when he wrote on Walden Pond or Walden, I can never remember what the name of the book is. And his whole thing, hundreds of years ago, was that because we are so focused on accumulating wealth or accumulating success or accumulating prestige, we end up slaves to that desire. And we never actually expand what it is to be human. We never actually expand the human potential because we just come into this slavery. And that's all Estea is protecting us from. 
is protecting us from this excess. This, and not only the accumulation of the excess, the work we have to do to purchase or get the excess, but even the thought process. Like when you think of in our mind, how much time we can spend thinking about the things we don't have or the things we want or the things we should want or the things that we should change in our own bodies or our lives or whatever. It's like we have the excess causes so many issues. And that's all Estea is, is saying to us is keep the bumpers up. Really live your life. So what's really interesting is in Patanjali's sutras, the sutra that talks about Asteya, you know, yeah, it says, when Asteya is established, all the treasures and jewels appear for the yogi. And this is really interesting, right? Because if we come back to our path analogy, that we're going along our path, and we are not worried about what other people have. We're not worried about what other people tell us we should want. And we are just staying on our path, on our journey, listening to these perfect, perfectly tuned chakras within us, listening to this perfectly tuned self within that knows what we're passionate about, knows what we're called to. All of a sudden, and we know that we are enough. We know that everything we need for this incarnation is inside of us. All the intelligence, all the courage, all the love, all the happiness, all the chutzpah, whatever it is that we need to get through our journey or to experience our journey, to manifest our journey is all inside of us right now. and we walk our path with this knowledge, everything we need will appear on our path for us. All the treasures, all the jewels, everything we desire will just appear. Another way that we steal from ourselves is actually in our mind. You know, so it's funny, you know, we talk about the physical world. We talk about, you know, having enough of those first chakra needs, you know, whether or not it's money or um, food, shelter, companionship, all that kind of thing. But, But there's also something inside of us that we steal from the moment. You know, we worry about things from the past. We worry about the future. We worry... What if this doesn't go right? What if this doesn't go, you know, the way we planned it? And that also steals from us, right? It steals from our current joy. It steals from this present moment. You know, there's a reason that they, they say that, you know, you always want to be here. Be here now. This is a huge spiritual tenet that you always want to be here. Because if we're anywhere else, we are, we're actually stealing from ourselves you know it's almost like there's all this possibility right now but we're not we're actually not even gonna have it we're just gonna you know the buddha used to say be where you are right now or you're gonna miss most of your life and again this is so interesting about this contentment of actually you know having enough right if we actually look at ourselves and we say you know, I have enough right now. And we sit quietly with it. Or even if I didn't have anything to worry about, I didn't have anything to worry about the past, and I didn't have anything to worry about in the future. It's almost like we don't know what to think about. Right? We don't know. I, well, if I'm not stressed out about this, then what am I thinking about? And the key there, when we find ourselves there, is to allow the stillness. Like it's so interesting because we struggle so much in meditation, all of us. I'm not saying, I'm not pointing fingers, I mean all of us. 
And it's almost like we are so unaccustomed to silence. We're so unaccustomed to stillness. We have this nervous part of us inside that says, okay, 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 what, like, what, what am I supposed to be thinking about? You know, what do I want? What should I do? What should I, maybe, maybe there's something I can go buy. <laughs> maybe if I, whatever. And it's like, no, just sit still. And the beautiful thing is if we sit still long enough, and this could be anything, we could be in a, we could be in a massive transition in our life, right? What if we've just left a situation, a job, a relationship, a town, a way of living, a philosophy, anything, right? We've had a great aha moment. It is so easy to go driving forward into the next thing, taking with us whatever we've known in the past. But the key to actually living in this joyful place of enough is to sit in it just to sit in it. It's like imagine sitting in your backyard. Let's say, let's pretend you have a backyard. I don't have a backyard, but let's say you have a backyard. And you're sitting there on your favorite lawn chair. The grass is green. The birds are singing. And you have nothing. You have no book, no phone, nothing to distract you. If we focus on what I want, oh, you know what would be really great right now? It would be a nice cold beer. Oh, you know what would be really great right now? If my friend came over. You know what would be really great right now is if I had some chocolate. If I had a great book. Oh, I wonder what's play. You know, we have this, there's got to be something else I can add to this moment. And this is the, this is the illness. This is the thing. So what if we practice a steya in that moment and we just sit surrounded by the grass and the birds. Well, what happens? All of a sudden you notice a smell of lilacs wafting in on the breeze. And all of a sudden you start breathing a little bit deeper. And you feel this beautiful air flowing through your lungs. And then all of a sudden you look over and you see a bumblebee going from flower to flower. And all of a sudden you realize the sky is so blue and the sun just beats down, warming your skin. And then you hear other birds calling and you just sit there and you realize that you're actually happy. And you're totally at peace. That we need nothing. This is what the sutra means. That when we practice asteya, all the treasures all the jewels appear on our path. Like they're right there all the time. And it's all for our joy. You know, when we release all these weird distractions, they're all artificial. They're not real. We feel happy. We feel joyful. We feel fulfilled. We, we feel the abundance of life. You know? And this and this, of course, is the whole point of yoga. This is the point of the yogic path, is to feel that way. Can I comment on asteya and addictions? Addictions are so interesting because because addictions are addictions have an extra level. Like asteya is it's almost like we all have a generalized addiction to more, but we spread it out. 
you know, we want a little bit more of that and a little bit more of that and a little bit more of that. And it looks very normalized, right? It, it's normal to want more money. It's normal to want to have a bigger house. It's normal to want to have extravagant this. This is luxury has become very normalized and not only normalized, but something you get, you aim for. So it's almost like as a general population, we always want more. And addictions seem to have a more focused path. And, but it's the same compulsion that if once I have a bit of it, then I want more. And then that, that having more makes me want more. And then I have more, then I want more. And then, but that could even be the addiction to money. Like I'm always amazed when people, and I, this sounds awful, but people will say, oh, I can hardly wait to, uh, um, you know, so my, my websites are all on a platform called Kajabi. And so I'm, I belong to a Facebook group all about, you know, for, for people who use Kajabi. And they'll talk about, oh, well, my goal this year is to make a million dollars and my, have a million sales. And I always think, do they have a cocaine addiction or something? Like, <laughs> what are they doing with a million dollars? And I'm not, and I really hope I'm not sounding arrogant or something. I just, I genuinely don't know what anyone would do with that kind of income. And, but it's, it's so normalized that it's, but is like, is that an addiction? Like, you know, first, first they, they finally make their first 50,000, then they make their first 100,000. And now my next goal is a million. Well, is that a whole lot different than many addictions? It's just interesting how some addictions are, and again, there's so many addictions that are so damaging, like I'm not taking away that in any way. But, you know, it's a very good question. Like, is that the foundation of addictions? And there's so much to talk about in addictions in terms of connections and intimacy and all kinds of things, right? There's also something really interesting about faith. Whatever faith is for you. So if you imagine you're walking through the woods and you need to you know, you want to find food or something like that, right? So you see some berries and you pick the berries. Well, if you're journeying, the likelihood is you're not going to take more than you need because you don't want to carry that much. You know, if you know you're going to be going over some barren land, maybe you take a few extra bits for a couple hours from now. But you're not going to, just because you come across a, fe- a whole plant of berries, you're not going to pick enough berries for a week and carry them. Instead, we have an interesting faith or a faith in nature that wherever I am in a day, there will also be some kind of food. And I'll find water and I'll find whatever I need. Right? There's a certain connection to nature that says all will be provided and it's and it, and it even goes deeper than that because again yoga is so much more than just this yoga when we are present we also hear our intuition and a, a really formative book for me was the book uh, mutant message down under by marlo morgan <laughs> <laughs> we are so in sync. That's hilarious. <laughs> and and they do the same thing. Like they're walking through the nat- they're, they're walking through the outback and they needed to find food. And of course food would always appear and a, a place for water would always appear. And and then one day Marlo Morgan, she had to lead the tribe. She had to lead the people, right? And she was so stressed out because she wasn't connected to the land. She wasn't connected to her intuition. And of course, they went days and days and days 
not finding food, not finding water, because she just couldn't get out of her head. And eventually she realized, okay, fine, and and she broke through something, right? She broke through something in her mind that allowed her to finally be intuitive. And that, again, comes back to this practice of asteya. We actually have to want to, we have to want to stop this madness. And oftentimes, you know, it can be, you know, illness or crisis or something like that, that forces us onto our own path and stops us from focusing on all these distractions, right? So it's kind of nice to actually find it through meditation instead, (laughs) to kind of... Um, my, my friend Nelda, years and years ago, probably over 20 years ago, I went to her and I was a bit of a Tasmanian devil, I think, in my mind, kind of caught in a life I didn't know how to get through or get out of or to heal or whatever. And she just looked at me one day and she says, you know, you could live your life like you're in a pinball machine, only changing direction when you hit a wall. Or you could choose to listen which to me is more the yogic path. What do you feel about raising children in a way of non-stealing as far as having enough, but the world and close relatives don't hold that view? It seems that the child will usually go with wanting more. They fall under the spell of this world. I continue on my path of consciousness, but see how the world influences the young. You know, honestly, We, our children see us more than we see, they see the world. Our example does count. It may not totally influence them. They may not follow in our footsteps, but we do matter and we matter more than the outside world. And when we quietly walk our path, we are always in their periphery. You know, whether maybe their karma or their patterns and their Akashic past, they have to do that. Maybe they need to work all this out in some way. But we are still in the corner of their mind. And the less we preach at them, the better. You know. Uh, Yeah, we get in savior mode, but it's our children. Like, this is a big deal. We don't want our kids to suffer. In all the reasons we're talking about this today, we don't want them to be distracted by all that. We want them to have a happy life. You know, so, you know, it's pretty hard to separate savior and mom mode, you know, or dad mode or whatever. That's a toughie. Or even grandparent mode. When we see, you know, or niece and nephews and all the great things, right? That's really tough. And, and, it's good to care, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's, it's all good. So it's a balance, right? There's a balance of desiring um, the best for people and really knowing that they're on their own journey and also really knowing that sometimes the desire to affect our children or our partners is also a distraction from our path. Right? It's really easy for me to teach my children what I've already figured out, but am I climbing my own mountain anymore? You know? So it's really an it's it's not a either or. It's just a it's it's all the things. We want to be conscious of all the possibilities, all the all the topics before us, right? Yeah. So thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs>